unusual couple. Oh, I don't think that was ever in question. To me, Wanda and Vision have always been the most complex, compelling Avengers. They have this epic love story. So I wanted to know, why do you guys think Wanda and Vision are so perfect for each other? Elizabeth, I'd love to hear from you first. Well, I think they're perfect for each other for like for many ways and for like a very comic book or MCU world is we, um, which is different from the comics, is we have them, um, they both have a piece of the same thing in their DNA. So I feel like there's this thing that naturally um, physically bonds them, the mind stone. And I think that's kind of like this beautiful representation of when we have this like unspoken connection with people where you feel like you've always been a part of them and they physically actually do have something that ties them together. Um, like literally, so that's, a literal soulmate. They're literally soulmates. And I, so I think there's something unspoken about it, um, as well as this like beautiful journey that Paul gets to go on where he's a robot trying to make sense of what feelings are and what feeling love is and her being this very empathetic, um, deep feeling woman helping him along with that is just such an innocent um, expression of love between the two of them. I think that's right. I also think that what makes them such a great unit, both as a fighting unit and just as a couple, is that, you know, uh, they complete each other, but in a good way. You know, they, they meet each other at the best bits of themselves. And I, I know lots of couples who complete each other, just not necessarily in good ways. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? They, they're like, yeah. they fit like this, but at all the good points of themselves, not like the shouty, passionate. <laughs> yeah. I know, right? If only we could go to a store and buy Mind Stones, you know, and then just like pick them <laughs> off the shelf. That'd be amazing. Elizabeth, what was it like for you to finally get to dive deep into Wanda as she grows more and more powerful? It was amazing. I mean, I, I also just love the opportunity as an actor to get to play in this genre um of sitcom like i just every to do that and then through this whole show we're exploring everything that she has experienced and processing that we have seen and that we haven't seen um and then we watch her grow from it so there's some there's it became like a whole rebirth and um for my like love and appreciation for this character after six years of playing her and and now i'm i feel like i have more sense of ownership with her because of this time right and i i was listening to an interview you did and it, it's cool because when you were first introduced to this character what you loved about her was like her origin story in the comic so it's really awesome to like get you watch to get to watch you sort of just play that out um paul with vision you know as we get to see more of him we're seeing his humanity grow and the show is very much a comedy. So what sides of vision were you excited to portray? I was slightly anxious at the beginning of this to think, well, is he, is he going to be the same guy? Uh, and how do I keep him the same guy? And then I realized actually vision's been changing the whole time. He's sort of, but you see him born and he's omnipotent yet naive. And that was fun to play with. And then by, civil war he's really on this journey to try and understand what humanity is and what's the whole deal with love and all of that and then by uh you know infinity war he is uh you know arguably and ironically uh, you know one of the most human characters in it and you know he's a bit of ultron he's a bit of jarvis he's a bit of tony stark and now we're throwing in a little bit of uh dick van dyke in and that's okay as long as <laughs> as long as the center uh, of him stays, which is that he's just sort of thoroughly decent and honorable and is, and now really exists for Wanda, his soulmate. Yeah, did you, Paul, did you think Vision was dead forever? Like, did you think you'd ever be playing him again after phase three? I was about 85% certain I was dead forever. <laughs> Yeah, I read that, um, you know, that Kevin called you to the studio and you oh, thought yeah, that you were sort of getting. That's 100% right. I, 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 I got the phone call. I, you know, I didn't, my contract was up. I just 
been killed twice, it felt pretty definitive. And then and then the boss rang up and told me to come in the office, and we all know what that means, right? And so I um, I looked at my wife and I went, I think uh, I think uh, yeah, we've done those expensive vacations, and um, and and uh, so I went in and I, I just wanted to make everybody feel comfortable, and so I said, look, it's, it's totally fine, I totally get it, it's been a great run, and thank you so much. And they went, are you quitting? And I went. No, aren't you firing me? And they went, no, we're going to pitch you a TV show. And I went, oh, I'm in. Um, um, and then I didn't listen to the pitch because I was just so relieved. Obviously, you know, WandaVision is this show where we get to explore American sitcom, you know, through the decades, meets MCU film. Which decade was the funnest or the funniest for you guys to dive into and play, Elizabeth? It's so hard to pick which one was more enjoyable because they were all very ridiculous in their own ways, um, which allow them to be um, beyond fun. And um, I specifically though loved um, the seventies because of its uh, absurd um, false representation of an aspirational family uh, whilst being pregnant, having contractions and giving birth because it is the most unrealistic version of a birthing experience one can have. <laughs> so I, en I enjoyed uh, chewing up that scenery for those moments. <laughs> I would agree. I loved all of that. I loved um, playing with those tropes and and him and, and and Vision getting so excited that that Wanda needs to get him to breathe, <laughs> even though she's the one having contractions. I loved all of that stuff, and I love I really love doing the the title sequence um, uh, montage, which uh, which um, really lent itself to. Uh, what it turns out is Elizabeth Olsen and my strong suit, which is overacting wildly. <laughs> Her montages. <laughs> your 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 mugging on the tandem is uh, will be a, a lasting memory for me. It's always how to find the camera. <laughs> Watching the show, you just know that the both of you are having like an absolute blast. Like it just seems like literally the most fun job an actor can have. And not just us. I mean, uh, and not just the cast. You know, I mean, I, I I'm I pull. Um, Jess Hall, who is a brilliant cinematographer who I've worked with three or four times. And uh, for him to be able to, you know, really nail all of these different looks for the for the different eras, he was uh, he was having a, a everybody. We would, it was just a really fun set. And I think you're right. I think you can feel it as you watch it. But it's also like simultaneously one of the hardest jobs. That's we've right. all had to do because of how often everything had to change. So it's really demanding on um, art direction. It's really demanding on the lighting always changing based on the decade, the lenses changing based on the decade, the costumers. I mean, you think about the exterior scenes and they would have to work overnight just changing something from the 70s to the 80s because the picket fence, the flowers, the paint, all of these things are going to have to change um, depending on the decade. So it was so hard but because we were having such a good time it made it all worth it and we all cared so much about the project so it was it was just a it was a gift this show it was i think birth it was like so hard you forget the hard bits but you just just remember the the gift you get afterwards it, this child it, you have to raise <laughs> it is such a gift i was on the receiving end of it our fans are massive fans of vision they think he has so much sex appeal why do you guys think vision is like the Ooh. zaddy of the avenger what is zaddy? I like that term. It's like the daddy. It's like the internet's daddy version, you know? Whoa. It's like the zaddy. Oh, yeah, yeah. What, is, what is it? I got to tell my wife. What is it? The zaddy. Zaddy? That's my time there. Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm terribly flattered. How lovely. <laughs> I have no idea why. It's if that you could purple. see me trying to climb into my costume, and if you could see me climbing out of my costume at the end, you might, you might not, they might not feel that way. Wanda, what's up? Who are you? I don't know. First of all, you look beautiful, and I have to just say, when I saw you in the show, and I, I love you in Mad Men, I was like, this 
person can rock period pieces like no other person I've ever seen. Thank you. It did feel very um like a throwback to my mammon days. Definitely. <laughs> I loved it. So obviously your character, Monica, has a super dope backstory in the comics. And I know a lot of people are going to be wondering how closely does your Monica Rambo resemble the comic book version? Um, well, I can speak to her personality, um, not really about what her journey is going to be um, in the MCU, but it's personality wise, I definitely went back to the comics to learn about who this woman was, how she handles conflict, how she um, has grown, uh, well, not grown, but um, who what her story arc is, right? And then I used that to inform how my Monica has grown since we last saw her in Captain Marvel when she was a young girl. Um, so I definitely took the, um, what I really loved about Monica in the comics is how ambitious she is. And Akira Akbar also um, did a great job of portraying that in her version of Monica. And um, so her ambition, how, very unapologetic she is to take up space and to be herself. Um, she's very yeah. bold and brave. And so I loved all of that about her. And I wanted to find where possible ways to um, bring that to our Wanda, uh, Monica here in WandaVision. Right, right. So bold. Ah, oh, we need it. I'm so excited. Obviously, you mentioned, you know, Captain Marvel. We haven't seen Monica since she was a little girl in Captain Marvel. So what has she been up to since Captain Marvel? Well, you will find out what Monica's been up to uh, since Captain Marvel, where she was a little girl throughout the course of WandaVision. We definitely dive into um, her backstory and what's been going on for her over the past years in um, yeah, we get into that. <laughs> <laughs> TBD. So, you know, when we look at the comics, Monica and Wanda are two of the strongest superheroes in the entire universe. So what do you think fans can expect to see when these two women come together in this new series of WandaVision? I'm trying not to give anything away. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> we, we will find out who Monica is and what she's capable of or not. And um, that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like what you her, sign your life away. <laughs> what her relationship with Wanda is, it will be revealed in the course of the show. Right. Can you tell us maybe what aspects of your character you're excited to, to explore in, in the upcoming projects? Because we know you're going to be, you know, in Captain Marvel too. Without giving anything away, it's like you haven't seen anything in WandaVision. So I, it's, it's hard to say what I'm right. looking forward to carrying over if you don't know that yet. So not really. Right. I am excited just as the actress to join Brie and Iman and see, you know, what the putting these three superheroes together, um, Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, Ms. Marvel and Monica Rambeau, what what will become and happen in uh, that film. But yeah, the rest, we're just going to have to wait a, a few weeks before we can really talk about it. <laughs> Okay. Well, we do know that this show, you know, WandaVision, from what we've seen in the trailers, is like the American sitcom through the decades meets like an MCU movie. So what was it like, you know, playing these different decades? And is there one that was your favorite, you know, to sort of dive into and play? So we definitely, so the in WandaVision, we pay homage to the different decades of American television through sitcom. And I actually got to watch um, my castmates do um, the 50s episode. I got to be a part of the live audience. And so that was a really exciting, just watching how much um, specificity and detail it has gone into each episode, um, being mindful and true to its time period was really, really exciting. Um, they've just put so much effort into each episode in each decade. And then my favorite to be in, I would say was the seventies. That was pretty, you know, that was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> it just was, it's, it, it made me come outside of myself and what I'm used to doing. And I've actually never done sitcom in real life. So 
being a part of a sitcom um, was a very different experience and flexed, required me to flex very different muscles uh, in my, uh, to, in my instrument. So that was, that was fun. Yeah, that's cool that you've never done that before. And and now like in the MCU, I know, I mean, I know you've been in like some pretty iconic projects, but that must have been like so much, you know, to to yeah. sort of like bring out of yourself. Yeah, I mean, you you hear Marvel, you're like, yeah, guys, I signed up to be thrown across a room and to, I don't know, CGI some stuff, but then to get the opportunity to actually, you know, do all of those things and uh, check something else off my wish list of as an actor, which is being in a sitcom and being a part of that structure and learning how to navigate that that art form, that was really cool. I, I was not expecting that when I heard I was joining the MCU. What was it like working with Elizabeth and Paul? They seemed like they'd be really, I mean, just watching the show, you're like, these people are just having so much fun. So what was it like, like physically being there? Lizzie and Paul, man, I am so, so blessed to have been able to come into the MCU alongside these two beautiful human beings and and as artists they're just so they're so generous and so um so good like I don't even know what else to say like they're it's like watching them be able to explore the relationship between Wanda and Vision with more space and freedom was really really um exciting for me particularly being a fan of their relationship before I even joined the MCU. So um, that was really exciting. And, and they're just very kind people and funny. <laughs> and yeah, so it was it was a pleasure to go and be with them and create with them. You know, did, you mentioned like getting the call for Marvel, you know, and like agreeing to get thrown across a room. Like, did you have to go into any specific training for your character? I did not, and I probably should have. Um, yeah, no, I, there was no advanced training. But moving forward, I will definitely get some training. <laughs> you know, it's just a very odd thing to the sensation of being lifted like on a wire so that you can float to you know get thrown across the room or something like you see in the trailer um it's very weird and odd and not natural and that is something you you, you should probably practice for a while to, so that it becomes natural so when you're actually acting with your scene partner you're not worried about this uncomfortable strap that is poking and prodding at some business it should not be touching um you can focus on the matter at hand um so yeah i didn't get any training but i will moving forward <laughs> um, okay, so you get, you know, you've done all these huge projects, you get the call, you know, to come to the MCU. What was that like? And then also like diving into Monica, knowing, and, and this is just me saying this, that she is a very integral part of the future of the MCU. Like she's kind of a really big deal. So walk me through like all those emotions and, and sort of like entering the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Well, when I found out it was Monica Rambeau who I'd gotten the part for, <laughs> I was definitely, I was already familiar with her as a superhero just because previously, like years ago, fans had started casting me, fan casting me as her. Uh, and I was like, well, who is this? And so let me look it up. And I, so I did like a brief look up of her and an understanding of her. And I was like, oh, wow, she is a badass. Would love to do it probably never will happen. So when I found out it was actually happening, I was like, whoa, what? Um, really excited. And I, I, you know, I don't know how she fits into the future of the MCU any more than what we've all been told, which is she joins Captain Marvel too. Um, but I, 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 knowing her rich history in the comics or, you know, barely scratching the surface, having a, a general understanding of it, I'm still learning and figuring all of that out. But um, I, I, I am truly honored for the opportunity to tell her story and to bring her to life. And so we'll see, we'll see what happens. That is so dope that people were fan casting you. And now here we are. 
That's thank wild. You. Thank y'all. Thank you for putting it into the atmosphere and claiming it for me. <laughs> Have you guys talked about when you're going to shoot Captain Marvel 2? Have you already shot some stuff? No, we have, I, I can say we haven't started shooting and I don't know when we will start. You know, it's very interesting times we're in. So I imagine they'll start as soon as they can when it's safe for everybody. So we'll see. Am I dead? No. Why would you think that? Because you are. Catherine, I'm so excited to talk to you. I mean, I've just seen you in, in so many things. It's, it's This is very exciting for me. Uh -huh. I It's really cool that you play, you know, Agnes, the nosy neighbor. And I was thinking of the concept of neighbor and how that's just taken on a whole new meaning in quarantine. But what was it like playing the nosy neighbor? Was it fun? Yes. I mean, it's, it's the best. It's the best. I mean, I couldn't have dreamt a more dreamy part in the MCU than this one. Like, it was so fun to be able to go from decade to, to decade, to be able to like play with different, with, with different genres of comedy to be, and wigs, forget it, love that. And then also to be able to just like, you know, it's always the neighbor, it's, uh, it's just always about the timing, you know, whatever that neighbor appears. And so that, that was, just, it was just like a, a blast to be able to like, to play with that. And to become like pals on screen and off with Lizzie, like it was it's such a treat. Aw, what was it like working with her and Paul? Uh, I adore her. I, I mean, I just adore her. Like, I, I just think she's one of the greatest. And we had, um, it was a real, uh, I will hold this experience like really close, close to my heart. It was a special one. Um, and, and Paul as well, he's hilarious, hilarious. And we, I mean, that first episode that was shot in front of a studio audience was, I mean, legit, we were running back and forth behind the scenes, like be behind the set, just like as if we were putting on a play. Like what you don't see is us like quick changing, grabbing props, running into it and to be make sure we were by this door for this entrance. Like we rehearsed it for uh, like for a long time to make sure that we could on the day perform it like a play in front of that audience. And so right. in terms of like, um, just just in terms of of ensemble building like we felt like we were an old theater company and i was like and then i had, i kept having to step back and be like i'm in that this is the this is in the mcu like it was so <laughs> it was so awesome very, it's so very trippy very trippy and you're right you know paul and vision is really funny it, it's oh, fun amazing. seeing him it's fun seeing, you know, the human side of him come out and, and grow the more and more we see him. But what was it like? Tell us more about what it was like shooting in front of a live studio audience and how that sort of maybe like elevated the material. Well, exactly that. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think because because we were afforded the the luxury, which a lot of things don't productions don't have, we were allowed to because it was it was going to be filmed live like this little play. We had the luxury of being able to rehearse. And that is something that was really quickly bonding for all of us because we all knew we were just gonna throw ourselves out there and see what happened on that day in front of like a lot of people. And, um, you know, the Jack Shaver who wrote the, the script wrote something that was is so tonally perfect to the, like to that era. And it's, those jokes are very, they're not cynical. Like there's something like really, there's something that's so charming about it. Um, and that was, I think like the, the trick was to not step outside of it and comment on it like performance wise, but just to stay inside, inside of it. And, mm -hmm. um, that's hard, you know, it's difficult. I, you know, I, I, I definitely like come from like an improv, improvisey, you know, turns out like I'm a little bit of a cynic, <laughs> like it's hard. Like there was something that was so charming about just being in, in the purity of that, um, right that was and just the once those lap those first couple laughs started happening from the audience because we honestly were like i don't know are people gonna laugh because this is like really i don't know like these who are these audience members like what's happening and then once those laughs it was all so surreal it was so surreal but once it started happening it was like we all went on this ride together like we all just had this like beautiful the, you know, couple of hours, this audience and us and the camera people and the, the mm -hmm. props and everybody. And it was like, I'll just hold that day to my heart. Like it was really um, magic. 
You're right. Well, well, you could definitely feel your magic coming off screen. And you're right. There is a purity to it and you nailed it because you don't want it to be a parody of this thing. You want to like really be it. And it was just so, so cool. And I know you keep saying you can't believe you're the MCU. I read that you you were saying that you think your kids must think you're so cool, but now you are in the MCU. So how would you like to see Agnes involved in the MCU like moving forward? Oh, I mean, in, in any way. I mean, I would just love her to be just like in, you know, in any any film, just kind of knocking into the door with a cup of tea for anybody with with a lot of unearned, uh, unasked for advice and a lot of uh, nosiness and suspicions. Like, I just feel like if there was, <laughs> I don't know how the nosy neighbor is going to figure into the MCU, but but I I loved I, I loved playing her in this so madly. Right. And what's cool is that we we got a little glimpse of the fact that you get to play, it looks like multiple different characters. So, you know, watching the first couple episodes, there's definitely inspiration from Bewitched. Yeah. You have Scarlet Witch. And then we see you sort of wearing this witch hat, letting out this amazing cackle. Why do you think witches are so important to this show? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know about that, but I do know that, I mean, it's her, it's Wanda's or it's Wanda's origin story. So I guess we get to go, you know, we get to dig into that. And I, I think we all know who she is. So that, that I think right, is totally, yeah. <laughs> what was it like shooting um, all the different decades? You know, that must've been so much fun. I keep hearing your voice in my head, actually, Catherine, when people are like, what'd you think of the show? I'm like, oh, it's a gas. Like, I can't, I can't hear your voice in my head. I love the way you say should that. Should I say you're well, welcome or should I say I'm so sorry? Say, I know, exactly. <laughs> say you're welcome and I'm sorry to all my friends because that's like my new favorite phrase. What was your favorite decade and what was it like shooting, you know, all, I mean, I in think all these different that- decades? I think that the fifties were probably my favorite to shoot just because of like what we talked about before, because of the interaction with the audience, because it was the first time together. And because mm-hmm. we were like, it felt like we were like, just like on the, on the, just jumping off this cliff together. Of like, is this going to work? Like, you know, it was such a huge leap and we had no idea like how it was going to land. And so I think that that thrill, that will, that will be my favorite. Um, uh, visually, you know, I'm a kid of the eighties, so I, I love that big hair and I love, you know, nice all that stuff. That's so funny. Everyone I asked that question to said the seventies, which is like so hilarious. I'm like, they must oh, have had so much fun shooting the seventies. Yeah. 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 Hilarious. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, this show is like nothing we've ever seen before. It's like totally its own thing. Can you give us like two different references to describe this show? Like, is it like, I dream of genie meets I don't know, something oh, else. Like what, what What are Catherine's like two different crosses and references to this? Yeah, I would definitely it? say to me, it would be like, leave it to Beaver slash Twilight Zone. Or like, you know, depending on the era, it would just be like, insert your favorite family sitcom growing up meets Twilight Zone. The Wonder Years meets Twilight Zone. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Malcolm in the Middle meets Twilight Zone. <laughs> you could do any sitcom you wanted meets Twilight Zone. I think something's wrong here. Kevin, I was watching um, the last time I talked to you, which was an interview we did on the purple carpet at Endgame. And you were telling me how awkward oh. you felt doing those interviews. And I was thinking to myself, like, oh, I, wonder, I wonder how Kevin feels doing these Zoom interviews. <laughs> I, you know what? It might be a little less awkward. Uh, because I'm just in my basement, um, and we're used to it now. But you know, it, it's it's actually the opposite. I now miss. I was taking for granted that purple carpet was amazing, and maybe I should just get over it. Um, because <laughs> being together and being with all those people and all those fans and all those um, reporters is a privilege, and I will not yeah. uh, I will not take it for granted again. After this, no, uh, after this, experience. none of us will. Um, okay, so I'll get right to it. WandaVision, our first official installment into phase four of the MCU. How much did COVID shift things and where will this show take us into the future? Well, COVID shifted a lot like it did for, for the entire world, um, mainly in just the order in which some of our, of our um, um, projects were released. Uh, WandaVision was gonna be our second Disney Plus show uh, Falcon and Soldier first, based on some of the rescheduling. WandaVision, of course, is first, which in hindsight is actually great and is actually better. 
because it's our first foray into television being this love letter to the format of television um, makes all the sense in the world. Um, uh, and we had to change and adjust the way everybody has. We do interviews like this. We do uh, uh, development meetings like this. We do editorial meetings like this. We do art department meetings like this, like this being uh, uh, remotely. And the production process itself um, uh, has gotten back on track in a way that is, um, has remarkably adapted to safety measures and, and the, the, the masks. And on productions, it's not just masks, it's sunglass, it's uh, glasses, but goggles, it's face plates. And everybody just accepts it and does the work in a safe, uh, in as safe a way as possible. And um, uh, other than that, uh, creatively, um, it hasn't shifted sort of our goals or our um, dreams of what of what these projects can be. It just, as it did for the whole world, delayed us. And what, like you were saying, it's really great that WandaVision's first. I remember you saying one time that WandaVision is one of the most powerful beings in the universe. So which of her powers are you like most stoked and excited to explore in this series of Wanda? Um, well, well, sort of, uh, sort of all of them, but all of it as an extension of her um, uh, experiences. That's what that's what I'm excited about. Is um, she's gone through so much in the movies that we get to finally tap into that, and what would that mean? And also further discovering who she is and what she can do and where it all came from um, is fun. And what and what. We could talk more about once everyone's seen every episode, but we can't now. Right. Well, we can talk about, you know, Monica Rambeau now being on the show, which is super, yeah. super exciting, getting to see more of her. How integral are, are Monica and Wanda going to be to the future of the MCU? Well, um, uh, very. We've already announced that uh, uh, we'll next see Wanda uh, after this uh, series. She's a big part of uh, teaming up with Doctor Strange in his movie, the in the Multiverse of Madness, and Tiana Paris will be joining Brie Larson uh, in Captain Marvel 2. So, so we already have, um, have uh, big plans for where they, where they go after this, uh, after this introduction, which is uh, great fun. Yeah, and it's just awesome because it feels like women are really going to be taking the lead in phase four, which I am super stoked for. Uh, but watching WandaVision, you know, Kevin, it's very much an American TV sitcom. And it's hilarious. It feels very family centered. Are we going to be able to see any of Wanda's other family members? Like, let's say Quicksilver or Magneto? Uh, well, yes, she's got a lot of family members in the comics. Um, this is, <laughs> this is uh, yeah, more about that relationship with Vision. And more about uh, about that dynamic and that and that uh, uh, the relationship of that couple and the evolving relationship of that of that couple um, uh, and how that grows and evolves and, and unfolds. Yeah, but is there a possibility maybe that we might see other family members? Uh, there are other characters in other episodes of this uh, show. Um, who they are, what they are, not uh, not worth discussing. Uh, right, right. Kevin, I want to ask you about the multiverse because, you know, you confirmed that WandaVision is directly connected to Doctor Strange 2. The multiverse was teased a little bit at the end of Spider-Man Far From Home. You know, you know, what can you tell us about that playing a part in the future of the MCU? Well, I mean, the title of the next Doctor Strange movie is Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. So that is that is our biggest clue that that um, that movie will embrace um, the multiverse and the madness uh, therein uh, very directly. There are, as we always like to, to do, connections before and after that, which will remain to be seen and discovered. Um, but it, it seemed appropriate that it would be Doctor Strange that uh, takes that on in the most direct uh, in the most direct way. Nice. And this show is just so stylistically different. You know, I, I was watching it, Kevin, and I was like, my mom's going to love this. Like, this is how I'm going to get my mom into the MCU. I'm so excited. It's stylistically so different than anything we've ever seen in the MCU. Can fans expect like these sort of really distant, distinct approaches to like these future shows we're going to see on Disney Plus through the MCU? I hope so. I mean, it's, um, we, uh, you know, I've, I always say that, that if you look at Taika Waititi's Thor or John Favreau's Iron Man or James Gunn's Guardians or Joss's Avengers or Joe and Anthony's Avengers, um, uh, 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 Peyton's Ant-Man, um, 
and certainly Kugler's Panther, they all have tonal distinctions. They all have superheroes in them, but they all have are tonally distinct. None perhaps as clearly and obviously as a black and white 50s sitcom necessarily, but um, we always try to do that. And that will continue in the movies, Chloe ja Jaws, um, Eternals, coming up, Des Destin Cretton's uh, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, um, uh, uh, Kate Shortland's uh, Black Widow, which I can't wait for people to see, um, all uniquely distinct from one another. And certainly continuing that with, uh, with uh, our Disney Plus shows. Loki is a very unique crime thriller starring Tom Hiddleston. We've announced that She-Hulk is a, a half hour uh, legal comedy. Um, we yeah. love to, to keep taking these characters to, uh, to new places and all of it inspired by stuff from the comics because the comics um, of course have a huge uh, depth of uh, storytelling styles and characters which for people who really are immersed in them and read them can uh, uh, understand that, respect that. Yeah, I love it. When I was reading that about She-Hulk, I'm like, is this gonna be like Law and Order? Like super cool. Was there a favorite decade um, that you that you had in, in WandaVision that well, was fun for you to I, dive into? I love aspects of them all. I love the, um, the sort of uh, 60s, 70s, early 70s, Sherwood Schwartz, uh, uh, Brady Bunch era. I love the, which Dick Van Dyke, two bed in the bedroom, um, black and white uh, era. They they all are are uh, unique and and fun. And it's uh, in those first three episodes, it's only just starting. So that's also exciting as people are going to see more week to week. Um, I recently read that you tapped Mike Waldron, EP of Loki, to write your upcoming Star Wars project, which I'm so excited for. What stories are you stoked to explore in that universe? Uh, the, all I will say is, is uh, Waldron, um, we were big fans of from his Rick and Morty um, episodes. He came in and created and developed for television the Loki series and did such an amazing job that we brought him on. We brought him on to the Multiverse of Madness, Doctor Strange sequel, which is what he's actually working on now. Uh, anything else is uh, rumors to be discussed at another time. Matt, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Massive fan of like almost everything you've done. Um, obviously, the topic of discussion here is WandaVision. WandaVision is a show, you know, where you have the American TV sitcom meets the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Stylistically, I can't think of two things that are more like different or opposite of each other. So how did you approach balancing, you know, American TV sitcom and the MCU? It's a great question. One of the things I love about Marvel Studios is its risk taking and their original storytelling. And who would have ever thought that after Iron Man, you would see something like Gardens of Guardians of the Galaxy or Thor Ragnarok. And so what is the MCU is a constantly evolving thing. Um, and mm -hmm. obviously here comes WandaVision to continue to shake that up. Um, we were focused on telling a love story, really, first and foremost. This is about Wanda and Vision, this incredible couple that we've all come to know and love, even in relatively short amount of screen time in these Avengers movies. They've managed to be charming and funny and sweet, and of course, they've suffered great loss. And so this story is about that love story, that romance that kind of drags us through. So even as we play with style and tone and go to different genres, that is the through line. That's the thing that pulls you through. Right. Oh, such an epic love story. I love it. You're right. You're absolutely right. I was just talking to Kevin and he was saying, you know, based off who the director is, that's what the style of, of the thing is, whether it's Black Panther or WandaVision. How did you, you know, did you have a different approach when shooting scenes for Wanda versus shooting scenes with Vision? And like, how did you want to tell their stories both separate and together? You know, we, we dove into these really specific sitcom worlds and want it to be as authentic as possible. We didn't want to feel like we were doing parody or spoof. And so that meant a lot of research for, for me, for my designers, everyone on the team, and especially the actors, because they had to capture the spirit of the comedy and the style. So we worked with dialect coaches and movement coaches and, and all of that to try to be as accurate as we could be. But ultimately, we were creating our own show, WandaVision, our own show in the 50s. And then that own, our, our show continued on into the 60s and the 70s. And we borrowed from a lot of great shows like Dick Van Dyke and I Love Lucy and Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie. But in the end, we were trying to create our own show, just kind of osmosing and borrowing all those different styles. 
Yeah. And when you take a step back, it's like, you really did that. It really does feel like its own thing. What's cool for you though, Matt, is like you, you started and grew up around sitcoms, like your entire childhood. So this must've been a really cool, like walk down memory lane for you. I first wanted to ask you about what it was like shooting in front of a live studio audience. It really was a trip, uh, you know, down memory lane and 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 part therapy also as well, you know, to <laughs> all of this past, be like, oh my gosh. Um, uh, but it was great, you know, because I, I got a chance to to shoot even on the same back lot where I shot this show, Just the Ten of Us, for many years. We shot at Warner Brothers Ranch on, the, on this very famous sitcom street called Blondie Street, which has the Partridge Family House and I Dream of Jeannie and Bewitched and so on. And so there I was in this place I used to skateboard when I was, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, shooting this wow. show that was honoring, you know, the history of television. So the ghosts yeah. of my own past, the ghosts of television past all together. Um, <laughs> um, and then, yeah, live live studio audience. You know, I remembered the rhythm of my life back then was the rhythm of a sitcom show. You know, it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, rehearsal, Thursday, camera blocking, Friday, the big tape day, and then it all started again the following week. And so here we were approximating that, um, at least, you know, for our first episode, which we did in front of a live audience. And, and it was fun to kind of, uh, you know, orchestrate all of those elements from the other side of the camera. There really is nothing like putting on a show in front of an audience and uh, it changes the way the actors are. It changes the energy in the room, the pace, everything. You, you're introducing another character. And those shows that taped in front of a live audience that were our touchstones like Lucy and like Dick Van Dyke, they did it in front of an audience. And so we needed to as well. Yeah, and you can tell, right? You can feel that energy. Everything feels bigger. It sort of like elevates the material. I was also reading that you did extensive research. You interviewed people who used to put on these shows. You read books. I think you gave the actors like a crash course in American TV sitcoms. Can you share a little bit about what your biggest inspiration was? I know you mentioned a couple shows, but I think you like sat down with Dick Van Dyke and, and, um, and Kevin Feige. We did. We had the greatest lunch of all time. Um, uh, one that I will certainly remember to be there with both of these heroes uh, of mine um, at Disneyland. We did it during the weekend of D23. We've been trying to sort of figure out when we could schedule it and they were honoring um, Dick Van Dyke then at D23. So we sat down at Club 33 above Pirates of the Caribbean. So there we were meeting with the ultimate sort of Disney legend of the past with Kevin, a new Disney legend of the present. Um, wow. And it was really fun. And um, we, we got a chance to tell him how much his work meant to us and also to ask him, you know, what was the special sauce? How did it work? How did you create this show that is still just as good today as it was back then? You know, how do you make something so timeless? Um, and also, how do you make room to do something that silly and fun? And he's such amazing physical comedian. How do you do all of that while still feeling like you're telling a, a real true story um, so that it, it's something that everyone can relate to. And it's not just goofiness for goofiness sake. And he was wonderful and generous and told us all sorts of wonderful bits of wisdom that we used. Um, but yeah, we talked to lots of different people. We, um, our, our special effects coordinator, who's amazing, this guy, Dan Sudik, um, actually came up under the people who did the special effects for Bewitched and I Dream of Genie. Mm -hmm. So he had direct knowledge and experience with wires and rods and all of this. And so when I asked Dan to bring that back, you know, it was like dusting off an old lost musical instrument and figuring out how to make it work again. And it was really fun. It's so charming to see things flying through the air in front of your face on wires and rods. It's honestly amazing. I, I found it really interesting to read too, that it was like a mix between that and CG, how some of some of the rods were, or, you know, wires were taken out. I, I just think it's like so, so cool what you guys did. Let's talk about the decades. What was it like directing, you know, all these different decades and which one was your favorite? They all had their charms. And, you know, I love the live studio audience. Who doesn't love that? I'm a theater director too. So it was really fun to kind of put on a show. Um, uh, but the seventies, you know, the style, the color, it's hard to beat that, you know, it really is. And yeah, that was my favorite yeah. set probably as well. The 70s family home um, was just one that I could hang out with all the time. You know what's crazy? I've interviewed uh, like the cast and everybody said the 70s, even <laughs> Kevin. Like, what was it you got, you know, is there a story or day from set that pops up in memory? Like, why do you think that was like everyone's favorite? You know, it, it's just, 
it's such a bold decade and everyone looks so great and the yeah. wigs and the clothes and the, you know, the, it's just the colorful world. It just, it's like a giant pick me up just being in that world. Yeah, it's cool. Um, I also wanted to ask you, you know, you've directed episodes for Game of Thrones, The Boys. Is there, you know, is there a difference or a different way that you approach directing drama and superhero drama? It's a good question. I also do a lot of comedies, like it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Yes, like yes. That. So um, I live this kind of strange schizophrenic life where jumping around these different <laughs> styles. And then WandaVision was a chance to be sort of schizophrenic 24 seven on the show by its very nature. Um, but I think directing sort of is directing. So, you know, I come from theater too. And in theater, you, you're expected to work at Summerstock and do the musical, the Shakespeare play and the Noel Coward and the brand new play. And that's just what it is. And you kind of adjust your approach depending on the material, you know, and yeah, it's a little bit more complicated when you have to deal with the effects and things like that. But really, I don't know, you know, uh, magic tricks on wires and rods is just as hard as dragons, let me tell you. And I think the hardest thing of all is comedy, really. Um, because, mm, you know, wow. finding something that works that also feels grounded, I think comedy requires more precision than anything else. This is our home. Then let's fight for it. 